they followed them warily, treading noiselessly in the deep snow. The boarding-house was near the edge of the town, and soon they were at the crossroads which is beyond its boundary. Here three men were waiting, with whom Lawler and Andrews held a short, eager conversation. Then they all moved on together. It was clearly some notable job which needed numbers. At this point there are several trails which lead to various mines. The strangers took that which led to the Crow Hill, a huge business which was in strong hands which had been able, thanks to their energetic and fearless New England manager, Josiah H. Dunn, to keep some order and discipline during the long reign of terror. Day was breaking now, and a line of workmen were slowly making their way singly and in groups along the blackened path. McMurdo and Scanlon strolled on with the others, keeping in sight of the men whom they followed. A thick mist lay over them, and from the heart of it there came the sudden scream of a steam whistle. It was the ten-minute signal before the cages descended and the day's labour began. When they reached the open space round the mine shaft, there were a hundred miners waiting, stamping their feet and blowing on their fingers, for it was bitterly cold. The strangers stood in a little group under the shadow of the engine house. Scanlon and McMurdo climbed a heap of slag from which the whole scene lay before them. They saw the mine engineer, a great bearded Scotchman named Menzies, come out of the engine house and blow his whistle for the cages to be lowered. At the same instant, a tall, loose-framed young man with a clean-shaved, earnest face advanced eagerly towards the pithead. As he came forward, his eyes fell upon the group, silent and motionless under the engine house. The men had drawn down their hats and turned up their collars to screen their faces. For a moment the presentiment of death laid its cold hand upon the manager's heart. At the next he had shaken it off and saw only his duty towards intrusive strangers. "'Who are you?' he asked as he advanced. "'What are you loitering there for?' There was no answer, but the lad Andrews stepped forward and shot him in the stomach. The hundred waiting miners stood as motionless and helpless as if they were paralysed. The manager clapped his two hands to the wound and doubled himself up. Then he staggered away, but another of the assassins fired, and he went down sideways, kicking and clawing among a heap of clinkers. Menzies, the Scotchman, gave a roar of rage at the sight and rushed with an iron spanner at the murderers, but was met by two balls in the face which dropped him dead at their very feet. There was a surge forward of some of the miners, and an inarticulate cry of pity and of anger, but a couple of the strangers emptied their six-shooters over the heads of the crowd, and they broke and scattered, some of them rushing wildly back to their homes in Vermissa. When a few of the bravest had rallied, and there was a return to the mine, the murderous gang had vanished in the mists of the morning, without a single witness being able to swear to the identity of these men, who in front of a hundred spectators had wrought this double crime. Scanlon and McMurdo made their way back, Scanlon somewhat subdued, for it was the first murder job that he had seen with his own eyes, and it appeared less funny than he had been led to believe. The horrible screams of the dead manager's wife pursued them as they hurried to the town. McMurdo was absorbed and silent, but he showed no sympathy for the weakening of his companion. "'Sure it is like a war,' he repeated. "'What is it but a war between us and them, and we hit back where we best can?' There was high revel in the lodge-room at the Union House that night, not only over the killing of the manager and engineer of the Crow Hill Mine, which would bring this organisation into line with the other blackmailed and terror-stricken companies of the district, but also over a distant triumph which had been wrought by the hands of the lodge itself. It would appear that when the county delegate had sent over five good men to strike a blow in Vermissa, he had demanded that in return three Vermissa men should be secretly selected and sent across to kill William Hales of Stake Royal, one of the best-known and most popular mine-owners in the Gilmerton district, 
a man who was believed not to have an enemy in the world, for he was in all ways a model employer. He had insisted, however, upon efficiency in the work, and had therefore paid off certain drunken and idle employees who were members of the all-powerful society. Coffin notices hung outside his door had not weakened his resolution, and so in a free, civilized country he found himself condemned to death. The execution had now been duly carried out. Ted Baldwin, who sprawled now in the seat of honor beside the bodymaster, had been chief of the party. His flushed face and glazed, bloodshot eyes told of the sleeplessness and drink. He and his two comrades had spent the night before among the mountains. They were unkempt and weather-stained. But no heroes, returning from a forlorn hope, could have had a warmer welcome from their comrades. The story was told and retold amid cries of delight and shouts of laughter. They had waited for their man as he drove home at nightfall, taking their station at the top of a steep hill, where his horse must be at a walk. He was so furred to keep out the cold that he could not lay his hand on his pistol. They had pulled him out and shot him again and again. He had screamed for mercy. The screams were repeated for the amusement of the lodge. "'Let's hear again how he squealed!' they cried. None of them knew the man, but there is eternal drama in a killing, and they had shown the scourers of Gilmerton that the Vermissa men were to be relied upon. There had been one contretemps, for a man and his wife had driven up while they were still emptying their revolvers into the silent body. It had been suggested that they should shoot them both, but they were harmless folk who were not connected with the mines, so they were sternly bidden to drive on and keep silent, lest a worse thing befall them. And so the blood-mottled figure had been left as a warning to all such hard-hearted employers, and the three noble avengers had hurried off into the mountains, where unbroken nature comes down to the very edge of the furnaces and the slag heaps. Here they were safe and sound, their work well done, and the plaudits of their companions in their ears. It had been a great day for the scourers. The shadow had fallen even darker over the valley. But as the wise general chooses the moment of victory in which to redouble his efforts, so that his foes may have no time to steady themselves after disaster, so Boss McGinty, looking out upon the scene of his operations, with his brooding and malicious eyes, had devised a new attack upon those who opposed him. That very night, as the half-drunken company broke up, he touched McMurdo on the arm, and led him aside into that inner room where they had their first interview. "'See here, my lad,' said he, "'I've got a job that's worthy of you at last. You'll have the doing of it in your own hands.' "'Proud I am to hear it,' McMurdo answered. "'You can take two men with you, Manders and Riley. They have been warned for service. We'll never be right in this district until Chester Wilcox has been settled, and you'll have the thanks of every lodge in the coalfields if you can down him.' "'I'll do my best, anyhow. Who is he, and where shall I find him?' McGinty took his eternal, half-chewed, half-smoked cigar from the corner of his mouth, and proceeded to draw a rough diagram on a page torn from his notebook. "'He's the chief foreman of the Iron Dyke Company. He's a hard citizen, an old colour sergeant of the war, all scars and gristle. We've had two tries at him, but had no luck, and Jim Carnaway lost his life over it. Now it's for you to take it over. That's the house, all alone at the Iron Dyke Crossroad.' same as you see here on the map, without another within earshot. It's no good by day. He's armed and shoots quick and straight, with no questions asked. But at night, well, here he is with his wife, three children and a hired help. You can't pick or choose, it's all or none. If you could get a bag of blasting powder at the front door with a slow match to it. What's the man done? Didn't I tell you he shot Jim Carnaway? Why did he shoot him? What in thunder has that to do with you? Carnaway was about his house at night, and he shot him. That's enough for me and you. 
you've got to settle the thing right there's these two women and the children do they go up too they have to else how can we get him it seems hard on them for they've done nothing what sort of fool's talk is this do you back out easy counsellor easy what have i ever said or done that you should think i would be after standing back from an order of the body master of my own lodge if it's right or if it's wrong it's for you to decide you'll do it then of course i'll do it when well you had best give me a night or two that i may see the house and make my plans then very good said mcginty shaking him by the hand i leave it with you it'll be a great day when you bring us the news it's just the last stroke that'll bring them all to their knees mcmurdo thought long and deeply over the commission which had been so suddenly placed in his hands the isolated house in which chester wilcox lived was about five miles off in an adjacent valley that very night he started off all alone to prepare for the attempt it was daylight before he returned from his reconnaissance next day he interviewed his two subordinates manders and riley reckless youngsters who were as elated as if it were a deer hunt two nights later they met outside the town all three armed and one of them carrying a sack stuffed with the powder which was used in the quarries it was two in the morning before they came to the lonely house the night was a windy one with broken clouds drifting swiftly across the face of a three-quarter moon they had been warned to be on their guard against bloodhounds so they moved forward cautiously with their pistols cocked in their hands but there was no sound save the howling of the wind and no movement but the swaying branches above them mcmurdo listened at the door of the lonely house but all was still within then he leaned the powder bag against it ripped a hole in it with his knife and attached the fuse when it was well alight he and his two companions took to their heels and were some distance off safe and snug in a sheltering ditch before the shattering roar of the explosion with the low deep rumble of the collapsing building told them that their work was done no cleaner job had ever been carried out in the blood-stained annals of the society but alas that work so well organized and boldly carried out should all have gone for nothing warned by the fate of the various victims and knowing that he was marked down for destruction chester wilcox had moved himself and his family only the day before to some safer and less known quarters where a guard of police should watch over them it was an empty house which had been torn down by the gunpowder and the grim old color sergeant of the war was still teaching discipline to the miners of iron dyke leave him to me said mcmurdo he's my man and i'll get him sure if i have to wait a year for him a vote of thanks and confidence was passed in full lodge and so for the time the matter ended when a few weeks later it was reported in the papers that wilcox had been shot at from an ambuscade it was an open secret that mcmurdo was still at work upon his unfinished job such were the methods of the society of free men and such were the deeds of the scourers by which they spread their rule of fear over the great and rich district which was for so long a period haunted by their terrible presence why should these pages be stained by further crimes have i not said enough to show the men and their methods these deeds are written in history and their records wherein one may read the details of them there one may learn of the shooting of policeman hunt and evans because they had ventured to arrest two members of the society a double outrage planned at the vermissa lodge and carried out in cold blood upon two helpless and disarmed men there also one may read of the shooting of mrs larby when she was nursing her husband who had been beaten almost to death by orders of boss mcginty the killing of the elder jenkins shortly followed by that of his brother the mutilation of james murdoch the blowing up of the Staphouse family and the murder of the Stendals all followed hard upon one another in the same terrible winter. 
Darkly the shadow lay upon the valley of fear. The spring had come with running brooks and blossoming trees. There was hope for all nature bound so long in an iron grip. But nowhere was there any hope for the men and women who lived under the yoke of the terror. Never had the cloud above them been so dark and hopeless as in the early summer of the year 1875. End of chapter 5 Part 2, Chapter 6 of The Valley of Fear by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Danger It was the height of the reign of terror. McMurdo, who had already been appointed inner deacon with every prospect of some day succeeding McGinty as body master, was now so necessary to the counsels of his comrades that nothing was done without his help and advice. The more popular he became, however, with the freemen, the blacker were the scowls which greeted him as he passed along the streets of Vermissa. In spite of their terror, the citizens were taking heart to band themselves together against their oppressors. Rumours had reached the lodge of secret gatherings in the Herald office, and of distribution of firearms among the law-abiding people. But McGinty and his men were undisturbed by such reports. They were numerous, resolute, and well armed. Their opponents were scattered and powerless. It would all end, as it had done in the past, in aimless talk and possibly in impotent arrests. So said McGinty, McMurdo, and all the bolder spirits. It was a Saturday evening in May. Saturday was always the lodge night, and McMurdo was leaving his house to attend it when Morris, the weaker brother of the order, came to see him. His brow was creased with care, and his kindly face was drawn and haggard. "'Can I speak with you freely, Mr. McMurdo?' "'Sure.' "'I can't forget that I spoke my heart to you once, and that you kept it to yourself, even though the boss himself came to ask you about it. What else could I do if you trusted me? It wasn't that I agreed with what you said.' "'I know that well, but you are the one that I can speak to, and be safe. I've a secret here," he put his hand to his breast, and it is just burning the life out of me. I wish it had come to any one of you but me. If I tell it, it will mean murder for sure. If I don't, it may bring the end of us all. God help me, but I am near out of my wits over it." McMurdo looked at the man earnestly. He was trembling in every limb. He poured some whisky into a glass and handed it to him. "'That's the physic for the likes of you,' said he. "'No, let me hear it.' Morris drank, and his white face took a tinge of colour. "'I can tell it to you all in one sentence,' said he. "'There's a detective on our trail.' McMurdo stared at him in astonishment. "'Why, man, you're crazy,' he said. "'Isn't the place full of police and detectives? And what harm did they ever do us?' "'No, no, it, it's no man of the district. As you say, we know them, and it is little that they can do. But you've heard of Pinkertons?' "'I've read some of folk of that name.' "'Well, you can take it from me. You've no show when they are on your trail. It's not a take-it-or-miss-it government concern. It's a dead-earnest business proposition that's out for results and keeps out till by hook or crook it gets them. If a Pinkerton man is deep in this business, we're all destroyed. We must kill him. Ah, it's the first thought that came to you, so it will be up at the lodge. Didn't I say to you that it would end in murder? Sure, what is murder? Isn't it common enough in these parts? It is indeed, but it's not for me to point out the man that is to be murdered. I'd never rest easy again. And yet, it's our own necks that may be at stake. In God's name, what shall I do?" He rocked to and fro in his agony of indecision. But his words had moved McMurdo deeply. It was easy to see that he shared the other's opinion as to the danger and the need for meeting it. He gripped Morris's shoulders and shook him in his earnestness. "'See here, man!' he cried, and he almost screeched the words in his excitement. You won't gain anything by sitting keening like an old wife at a wake. Let's have the facts. Who is the fellow? Where is he? How did you hear of him? 
Why did you come to me? I came to you, for you are the one man that would advise me. I told you that I had a store in the East before I came here. I left good friends behind me, and one of them is in the telegraph service. Here's a letter that I had from him yesterday. It's this part from the top of the page. You can read it yourself." This was what McMurdo read. "'How are the scourers getting on in your parts? We read plenty of them in the papers. Between you and me I expect to hear news from you before long. Five big corporations and the two railroads have taken the thing up in dead earnest. They mean it. And you can bet they'll get there. They are right deep down into it. Pinkerton has taken hold under their orders, and his best man, Birdie Edwards, is operating. The thing has got to be stopped right now. Now, read the proscript. Of course, what I give you is what I learned in business, so it goes no further. It's a queer cipher that you handle by the yard every day, and can get no meaning from. McMurdo sat in silence for some time with the letter in his listless hands. The mist had lifted for a moment, and there was the abyss before him. "'Does anyone else know of this?' he asked. "'I have told no one else.' "'But this man, your friend, has he any other person that we would likely write to?' "'Well, I dare say he knows one or two more. "'Of the lodge? It's likely enough. "'I was asking because it is likely that he may have given some description of this fellow Birdie Edwards. "'Then we could get on his trail.' "'Well, it's possible, but I shouldn't think he knew him. He's just telling me the news that came to him by way of business. How would he know this Pinkerton man?" McMurdo gave a violent start. "'By gar!' he cried. "'I've got him. What a fool I was not to know it. Lord, but we're in luck. We'll fix him before he can do any harm. See here, Morris, will you leave this thing in my hands?' "'Sure, if you will only take it off mine.' I'll do that. You can stand right back and let me run it. Even your name need not be mentioned. I'll take it all on myself, as if it were to me that this letter has come. Will that content you? It's just what I would ask. Then leave it at that, and keep your head shut. Now I'll get down to the lodge, and we'll soon make old man Pinkerton sorry for himself. You wouldn't kill this man? The less you know, friend Morris the easier your conscience, and the better you'll sleep. Ask no questions, and let these things settle themselves. I have hold of it now." Morris shook his head sadly as he left. "'I feel that his blood is on my hands,' he groaned. "'Self-protection is no murder, anyhow,' said McMurdo, smiling grimly. "'It's him or us. I guess this man would destroy us all if we left him long in the valley. Why? Brother Morris, we'll have to elect you bodymaster yet, for you've surely saved the lodge." And yet it was clear from his actions that he thought more seriously of this new intrusion than his words would show. It may have been his guilty conscience. It may have been the reputation of the Pinkerton organization. It may have been the knowledge that great, rich corporations had set themselves the task of clearing out the scourers. But whatever his reason, his actions were those of a man who is preparing for the worst. Every paper which would incriminate him was destroyed before he left the house. After that he gave a long sigh of satisfaction, for it seemed to him that he was safe. And yet the danger must still have pressed somewhat upon him, for on his way to the lodge he stopped at old man Shafter's. The house was forbidden him, but when he tapped at the window Etty came out to him. The dancing Irish devilry had gone from her lover's eyes. She read his danger in his earnest face. "'Something has happened,' she cried. "'Oh, Jack, you are in danger.' "'Sure, it is not very bad, my sweetheart. And yet it may be wise that we make a move before it's worse.' "'Make a move? I promised you once that I'd go some day. I think the time is coming. I had news tonight, bad news, and I see trouble coming.' The police? Well, a Pinkerton. But sure, you wouldn't know what that is, a Kushler, nor what it would mean to the likes of me. I'm too deep in this thing, and I may have to get out of it quick. 
You said you'd come with me if I went. Oh, Jack, it would be the saving of you. I'm an honest man in some things, Etty. I wouldn't hurt a hair of your bonny head, for all the world can give, nor ever pull you down one inch from the golden throne above the clouds where I always see you. Would you trust me? She put her hand in his without a word. Well, then, listen to what I say, and do as I order you, for indeed it's the only way for us. Things are going to happen in this valley. I feel it in my bones. There may be many of us that will have to look out for ourselves. I'm one, anyhow. If I go, by day or night, it's you that must come with me. I'd come after you, Jack. No, no, you should come with me. If this valley is close to me, and I can never come back, how can I leave you behind? And me, perhaps in hiding from the police, with never a chance of a message? It's with me you must come. I know a good woman in the place I come from, and it's there I'd leave you till when we get married. Will you come? Yes, Jack, I will come. God bless you for your trust in me. It's a fiend out of hell that I should be if I abused it. Now mark you, Etty. It'll just be a word to you, and when it reaches you, you'll drop everything and come right down to the waiting room at the depot and stay there till I come for you. Day or night, I'll come at the word, Jack. Somewhat eased in mind, now that his own preparations for escape had been begun, McMurdo went on to the lodge. It had already assembled, and only by complicated signs and countersigns could he pass through the outer guard and inner guard who close-tiled it. A buzz of pleasure and welcome greeted him as he entered. The long room was crowded, and through the haze of tobacco smoke he saw the tangled black mane of the bodymaster, the cruel, unfriendly features of Baldwin, the vulture face of Haraway, the secretary, and a dozen more who were among the leaders of the lodge. He rejoiced that they should all be there to take counsel over his news. "'Indeed it's glad we are to see you, brother,' cried the chairman. "'There's business here that wants a Solomon in judgment to set it right.' "'It's Lander and Egan,' explained his neighbour as he took his seat. "'They both claim the head-money given by the lodge for the shooting of old man Crab over at Stylestown. And who's to say which fired the bullet?' McMurdo rose in his place and raised his hand. The expression of his face froze the attention of the audience. There was a dead hush of expectation. "'Eminent bodymaster,' he said in a solemn voice, "'I claim urgency.' "'Brother McMurdo claims urgency,' said McGinty. "'It's a claim that by the rules of this lodge takes precedence. Now, brother, we attend you.' McMurdo took the letter from his pocket. "'Eminent bodymaster and brethren,' he said, "'I am the bearer of ill news this day. But it is better that it should be known and discussed than that a blow should fall upon us without warning, which would destroy us all. I have information that the most powerful and richest organizations in this state have bound themselves together for our destruction, and that at this very moment there is a Pinkerton detective—' one Birdie Edwards, at work in the valley, collecting the evidence which may put a rope around the necks of many of us and send every man in this room into a felon's cell. That is the situation for the discussion of which I have made a claim of urgency. There was a dead silence in the room. It was broken by the chairman. "'What is your evidence for this, Brother McMurdo?' he asked. "'It is in this letter which has come into my hands.' said McMurdo. He read the passage aloud. "'It is a matter of honour with me that I can give no further particulars about the letter, nor put it into your hands. But I assure you that there is nothing else in it which can affect the interests of the lodge. I put the case before you as it has reached me.' "'Let me say, Mr. Chairman,' said one of the older brethren, "'that I have heard of Birdie Edwards.' and that he has the name of being the best man in the Pinkerton service. "'Does anyone know him by sight?' asked McGinty. "'Yes,' said McMurdo. "'I do.' There was a murmur of astonishment through the hall. "'I believe we hold him in the hollow of our hands,' he continued with an exulting smile upon his face. 
If we act quickly and wisely, we can cut this thing short. If I have your confidence and your help, tis a little that we have to fear. What have we to fear, anyhow? What can he know of our affairs? You might say so, if all were as staunch as you, Councillor. But this man has all the millions of the capitalists at his back. Do you think there is no weaker brother among all our lodges that could not be bought? He will get at our secrets. Maybe has got them already. There's only one sure cure. That he never leaves the valley, said Baldwin. McMurdo nodded. Good for you, Brother Baldwin, he said. You and I have had our differences. But you've said the true word tonight. Where is he, then? Where shall we know him? Eminent body master, said McMurdo earnestly. I put it to you that this is too vital a thing for us to discuss in open lodge. God forbid that I should throw a doubt on anyone here, but if so much as a word of gossip got to the ears of this man, there would be an end of any chance of our getting him. I would ask the lodge to choose a trusty committee, Mr. Chairman, yourself, if I might suggest it, and Brother Baldwin here, and five more. Then I can talk freely of what I know and of what I advise should be done. The proposition was at once adopted, and the committee chosen. Besides the chairman and Baldwin, there were the vulture-faced secretary, Haraway, Tiger Cormac, the brutal young assassin, Carter, the treasurer, and the brothers Willoughby, fearless and desperate men who would stick at nothing. The usual revelry of the lodge was short and subdued, for there was a cloud upon the men's spirits, and many there, for the first time, began to see the cloud of avenging law drifting up in that serene sky under which they had dwelt so long. The horrors they had dealt out to others had been so much a part of their settled lives that the thought of retribution had become a remote one, and so seemed the more startling now that it came so closely upon them. They broke up early, and left their leaders to their council. "'Now, McMurdo,' said McGinty, when they were all alone. The seven men sat frozen in their seats. "'I said just now that I knew Bertie Edwards,' McMurdo explained. "'I need not tell you that he is not here under that name. He's a brave man, but not a crazy one. He passes under the name of Steve Wilson, and he's lodging at Hobson's Patch. "'How do you know this?' "'Because I fell into talk with him. I thought little of it at the time, nor would have given it a second thought, but for this letter. But now I'm sure it's the man. I met him on the cars when I went down the line on Wednesday. A hard case, if ever there was one. He said he was a reporter. I believed it for the moment. Wanted to know all he could about the scourers, and what he called the outrages for a New York paper. Asked me every kind of question, so as to get something. You bet I was giving nothing away. I'd pay for it and pay well, said he, if I could get some stuff that would suit my editor. I said what I thought would please him best, and he handed me a twenty-dollar bill for my information. There's ten times that for you, said he, if you can find me all that I want. What did you tell him then? Any stuff I could make up. How do you know he wasn't a newspaper man? I'll tell you. He got out at Hobson's Patch, and so did I. I chanced into the telegraph bureau, and he was leaving it. See here, said the operator after he'd gone out. I guess we could charge double rates for this. I guess you should, said I. He'd filled the form with stuff that might have been Chinese for all we could make of it. He fires a sheet of this off every day, said the clerk. Yes, said I. It's special news for his paper, and he's scared that others should tap it. That was what the operator thought, and what I thought at the time. But I think differently now. By gar, I believe you're right, said McGinty. But what do you allow that we should do about it? Why not go right down now and fix him? Someone suggested. Aye, the sooner the better. I'd start this next minute if I knew where I could find him, said McMurdo. He's in Hobson's Patch, but I don't know the house. I've got a plan, though, if you'll only take my advice. Well, what is it? 
I'll go to the patch tomorrow morning. I'll find him through the operator. He can locate him, I guess. Well, then I'll tell him that I'm a free man myself. I'll offer him all the secrets of the lodge for a price. You bet he'll tumble to it. I'll tell him the papers are at my house, and that it's as much as my life would be worth to let him come while my folk were about. He'll see that that's horse sense. Let him come at ten o'clock at night, and he shall see everything. That will fetch him, for sure. Well, you can plan the rest for yourselves. Widow McManara's is a lonely house. She's as true as steel and as deaf as a post. There's only Scanlon and me in the house. If I get his promise, and I'll let you know if I do, I'd have the whole seven of you come to me by nine o'clock. We'll get him in. If ever he gets out alive, well, he can talk of Bertie Edwards' luck for the rest of his days. There's going to be a vacancy at Pinkerton's, or I'm mistaken. Leave it at that, McMurdo. At nine tomorrow we'll be with you. You once get the door shut behind him, and you can leave the rest with us. End of chapter 6 Part 2, chapter 7 of The Valley of Fear by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The Trapping of Birdie Edwards As McMurdo had said, the house in which he lived was a lonely one, and very well suited for such a crime as they had planned. It was on the extreme fringe of the town, and stood well back from the road. In any other case, the conspirators would have simply called out their man as they had many times before, and emptied their pistols into his body. But in this instance it was very necessary to find out how much he knew, how he knew it, and what had been passed on to his employers. It was possible that they were already too late, and that the work had been done. If that was indeed so, they could at least have their revenge upon the man who had done it. But they were hopeful that nothing of great importance had yet knowledge had come to the detective's knowledge, as otherwise, they argued, he would not have troubled to write down and forward such trivial information as McMurdo claimed to have given him. However, all this they would learn from his own lips. Once in their power, they would find a way to make him speak. It was not the first time that they had handled an unwilling witness. McMurdo went to Hobson's Patch as agreed. The police seemed to take particular interest in him that morning, and Captain Marvin, he who had claimed the old acquaintance with him at Chicago, actually addressed him as he waited at the station. McMurdo turned away and refused to speak with him. He was back from his mission in the afternoon, and saw McGinty at the Union House. "'He is coming,' he said. "'Good,' said McGinty. The giant was in his shirt-sleeves, with chains and seals to his ample waistcoat, and a diamond twinkling through the fringe of his bristling beard. Drink and politics had made the boss a very rich as well as powerful man. The more terrible, therefore, seemed that glimpse of the prison or the gallows which had risen before him the night before. "'Do you reckon he knows much?' he asked anxiously. McMurdo shook his head gloomily. "'He's been here some time, six weeks at least. I guess he didn't come into these parts to look at the prospect. If he's been working among us all that time with the railroad money at his back, I should expect that he's got results, and that he's passed them on. "'There's not a weak man in the lodge,' cried McGinty. "'True as steel, every man of them. And yet, by the Lord, there is that skunk Morris. What about him? If any man gives us away, it would be he.' I have a mind to send a couple of the boys round before evening to give him a beating up and see what they can get from him. Well, there will be no harm in that, McMurdo answered. I won't deny that I have a liking for Morris, and will be sorry to see him come to harm. He has spoken to me once or twice over lodge matters. I know he may not see them the same as you or I. He never seemed the sort that squeals. But still, it is not for me to stand between him and you. "'I'll fix the old devil,' said McGinty, with an oath. "'I've had my eye on him this year past.' "'Well, you know best about that,' McMurdo answered. "'But whatever you do must be to-morrow. "'For we must lay low 
until the Pinkerton affair is settled up. We can't afford to set the police buzzing today of all days. True for you, said McGinty. And we'll learn from Birdie Edwards himself where he got his news if we have to cut his heart out first. Did he seem to scent a trap? McMurdo laughed. I guess I took him on his weak point, he said. If he could get on a good trail of the scourers, he's ready to follow it into hell. I took his money. McMurdo grinned as he produced a wad of dollar notes. And as much more when he's seen all my papers. What papers? Well, there are no papers, but I filled him up about constitutions and books of rules and forms of membership. He expects to get right down to the end of everything before he leaves. Faith, he's right there, said McGinty grimly. Didn't he ask you why you didn't bring him the papers? As if I would carry such things, and me a suspected man, and Captain Marvin after speaking to me this very day at the depot. Aye, I heard of that, said McGinty. I guess the heavy end of this business is coming on to you. We could put him down an old shaft when we've done with him, but however we work it we can't get past the man living at Hobston's Patch, and you being there today. McMurdo shrugged his shoulders. If we handle it right, they can never prove the killing, said he. No one can see him come to the house after dark, and I'll lay to it that no one will see him go. Now see here, Councillor, I'll show you my plan, and I'll ask you to fit the others into it. You'll all come in good time. Very well. He comes at ten. He's to tap three times, and me to open the door for him. Then I'll get behind him and shut it. He's our man, then. That's all easy and plain. Yes, but the next step wants considering. He's a hard proposition. He's heavily armed. I fooled him proper, and yet he's likely to be on his guard. Suppose I show him right into a room with seven men in it where he expected to find me alone. There's going to be shooting, and somebody's going to be hurt. That's so. And the noise is going to bring every damned copper in the township on top of it. I guess you're right. This is how I should work it. You'll all be in the big room, same as you saw when you had a chat with me. I'll open the door for him, show him into the parlour beside the door, and leave him there while I get the papers. That will give me the chance of telling you how things are shaping. Then I'll go back to him with some faked papers. As he's reading them, I'll jump for him and get my grip on his pistol arm. You'll hear me call, and in you'll rush. The quicker the better, for he's as strong a man as I, and I may have more than I can manage. But I allow that I can hold him till you come. It's a good plan, said McGinty. The lodge will owe you a debt for this. I guess when I move out of the chair I can put a name to the man that's coming after me. Sure, Councillor. I'm little more than a recruit, said McMurdo, but his face showed what he thought of the great man's compliment. When he'd returned home, he made his own preparations for the grim evening in front of him. First he cleaned, oiled, and loaded his Smith & Wesson revolver. Then he surveyed the room in which the detective was to be trapped. It was a large apartment, with a long deal table in the centre, and the big stove at one side. At each of the other sides were windows. There were no shutters on these, only light curtains which drew across. McMurdo examined these attentively. No doubt it must have struck him that the apartment was very exposed for so secret a meeting. Yet its distance from the road made it of less consequence. Finally, he discussed the matter with his fellow lodger. Scanlan, though a scourer, was an inoffensive little man who was too weak to stand against the opinion of his comrades, but was secretly horrified by the deeds of blood at which he had sometimes been forced to assist. McMurdo told him shortly what was intended. "'And if I were you, Mike Scanlan, I would take a night off. I'd keep clear of it. There'll be bloody work here before morning.' "'Well, indeed, then, Mac,' Scanlan answered. "'It's not the will, but the nerve that is wanting in me. When I saw Manager Dunn go down at the colliery yonder, it was just more than I could stand.' 
I'm not made for it, same as you or McGinty. If the lodge will think none the worse of me, I'll just do as you advise, and leave you to yourselves for the evening. The men came in good time as arranged. They were outwardly respectable citizens, well clad and cleanly, but a judge of faces would have read little hope for Birdie Edwards in those hard mouths and remorseless eyes. There was not a man in the room whose hands had not been reddened a dozen times before. They were as hardened to human murder as a butcher to sheep. Foremost, of course, both in appearance and in guilt, was the formidable boss. Haraway, the secretary, was a lean, bitter man, with a long, scraggy neck and nervous, jerky limbs, a man of incorruptible fidelity where the finances of the order were concerned, and with no notion of justice or honesty to anyone beyond. The treasurer, Carter, was a middle-aged man with an impassive, rather sulky expression, and a yellow parchment skin. He was a capable organiser, and the actual details of nearly every outrage had sprung from his plotting brain. The two Willoughbys were men of action, tall, lithe young fellows with determined faces, while their companion, Tiger Cormac, a heavy, dark youth, was feared even by his own comrades for the ferocity of his disposition. These were the men who assembled that night under the roof of McMurdo for the killing of the Pinkerton detective. Their host had placed whisky upon the table, and they had hastened to prime themselves for the work before them. Baldwin and Cormac were already half drunk, and the liquor had brought out all their ferocity. Cormac placed his hands on the stove for an instant. It had been lighted, for the nights were still cold. "'That will do,' said he with an oath. "'Aye,' said Baldwin, catching his meaning. "'If he is strapped to that, we'll have the truth out of him.' "'We'll have the truth out of him, never fear,' said McMurdo. He had nerves of steel, this man, for though the whole weight of the affair was on him, his manner was as cool and unconcerned as ever. The others marked it, and applauded. "'You are the one to handle him,' said the boss approvingly. "'Not a warning will he get till your hand is on his throat. It's a pity there are no shutters to your windows.' McMurdo went from one to the other, and drew the curtains tighter. "'Sure no one can spy upon us now. It's close upon the hour. "'Maybe he won't come. Maybe he'll get a sniff of danger.' said the secretary. "'He'll come. Never fear,' McMurdo answered. "'He is as eager to come as you can be to see him. Hark to that!' They all sat like wax figures, some with their glasses arrested halfway to their lips. Three loud knocks had sounded at the door. "'Hush!' McMurdo raised his hand in caution. An exulting glance went round the circle and hands were laid upon their weapons. "'Not a sound for your lives,' McMurdo whispered as he went from the room, closing the door carefully behind him. With strained ears the murderers waited. They counted the steps of their comrade down the passage. Then they heard him open the outer door. There were a few words as of a greeting. Then they were aware of a strange step inside and of an unfamiliar voice, an instant later came the slam of the door and the turning of the key in the lock. Their prey was safe within the trap. Tiger Cormac laughed horribly, and Boss McGinty clapped his great hand across his mouth. "'Be quiet, you fool!' he whispered. "'You'll be the undoing of us yet!' There was a mutter of conversation from the next room. It seemed interminable. Then the door opened and McMurdo appeared, his finger upon his lip. He came to the end of the table and looked round at them. A subtle change had come over him. His manner was as of one who has great work to do. His face had set into granite firmness. His eyes shone with a fierce excitement behind his spectacles. He had become a visible leader of men. They stared at him with eager interest, but he said nothing. Still, with the same singular gaze, he looked from man to man. "'Well?' 
cried Boss McGinty at last. "'Is he here? Is Bertie Edwards here?' "'Yes,' McMurdo answered slowly. "'Bertie Edwards is here. I am Bertie Edwards.' There were ten seconds after that brief speech, during which the room might have been empty, so profound was the silence. The hissing of a kettle upon the stove rose sharp and strident to the ear. Seven white faces, all turned upward to this man who dominated them, were set motionless with utter terror. Then, with a sudden shivering of glass, a bristle of glistening rifle-barrels broke through each window, while the curtains were torn from their hangings. At the sight, Boss McGinty gave the roar of a wounded bear and plunged for the half-open door. A levelled revolver met him there with the stern blue eyes of Captain Marvin of the Mine Police gleaming behind the sights. The boss recoiled and fell back into his chair. "'You're safer there, Councillor,' said the man whom they had known as McMurdo. "'And you, Baldwin, if you don't take your hand off your pistol, you'll cheat the hangman yet. Pull it out, or by the Lord that made me. There, that will do. There are forty armed men round this house, and you can figure it out for yourself what chance you have. Take the pistols, Marvin.' There was no possible resistance under the menace of those rifles. The men were disarmed. Sulky, sheepish, and amazed, they still sat round the table. "'I'd like to say a word to you before we separate,' said the man who had trapped them. "'I guess we may not meet again until you see me on the stand in the courthouse. I'll give you something to think over between now and then. You know me now for what I am. At last I can put my cards on the table. I am Birdie Edwards of Pinkerton's. I was chosen to break up your gang. I had a hard and dangerous game to play. Not a soul.' Not one soul, not my nearest and dearest, knew that I was playing it. Only Captain Marvin here and my employers knew that. But it's over tonight, thank God, and I am the winner. The seven pale, rigid faces looked up at him. There was unappeasable hatred in their eyes. He read the relentless threat. Maybe you think that the game is not over yet. Well... I take my chance of that. Anyhow, some of you will take no further hand, and there are sixty more besides yourselves that will see a jail this night. I'll tell you this, that when I was put upon this job I never believed there was such a society as yours. I thought it was paper talk, and that I would prove it so. They told me it was to do with the freemen, so I went to Chicago and was made one. Then I was surer than ever that it was just paper talk for I found no harm in the society, but a deal of good. Still, I had to carry out my job, and I came to the coal valleys. When I reached this place I learned that I was wrong, and that it wasn't a dime novel after all. So I stayed to look after it. I never killed a man in Chicago. I never minted a dollar in my life. Those I gave you were as good as any others, but I never spent money better. But I knew the way into your good wishes and so I pretended to you that the law was after me. It all worked just as I thought. So I joined your infernal lodge, and I took my share in your councils. Maybe they will say that I was as bad as you. They can say what they like, so long as I get you. But what is the truth? The night I joined, you beat up old man Stanger. I could not warn him, for there was no time— but I held your hand, Baldwin, when you would have killed him. If ever I have suggested things, so as to keep my place among you, they were things which I knew I could prevent. I could not save Dunn and Menzies, for I did not know enough. But I will see that their murderers are hanged. I gave Chester Wilcox warning, so that when I blew his house in, he and his folk were in hiding. There was many a crime that I could not stop. But if you look back and think how often your man came home the other road, or was down in town when you went for him, or stayed indoors when you thought he would come out, you'll see my work. "'You blasted traitor!' hissed McGinty through his closed teeth. "'Aye, John McGinty, you may call me that if it eases your smart. 
You and your like have been the enemy of God and man in these parts. It took a man to get between you and the poor devils of men and women that you held under your grip. There was just one way of doing it, and I did it. You call me a traitor, but I guess there's many a thousand will call me a deliverer that went down into hell to save them. I've had three months of it. I wouldn't have three such months again if they let me loose in the treasury of Washington for it. I had to stay till I had it all, every man and every secret, right here in this hand. I'd have waited a little longer if it hadn't come to my knowledge that my secret was coming out. A letter had come into the town that would have set you wise to it all. Then I had to act, and act quickly. I have nothing more to say to you, except that when my time comes I'll die the easier when I think of the work I've done in this valley. Now, Marvin, I'll keep you no more. Take them in and get it over. There is little more to tell. Scanlan had been given a sealed note to be left at the address of Miss Etty Shafter, a mission which she had accepted with a wink and a knowing smile. In the early hours of the morning, a beautiful woman and a much muffled man boarded a special train which had been sent by the railroad company and made a swift, unbroken journey out of the land of danger. It was the last time that ever either Etty or her lover set foot in the Valley of Fear. Ten days later they were married in Chicago, with old Jacob Shafter as witness of the wedding. The trial of the Scourers was held far from the place where their adherents might have terrified the guardians of the law. In vain they struggled. In vain the money of the lodge, money squeezed by blackmail out of the whole countryside, was spent like water in the attempt to save them. That cold, clear, unimpassioned statement from one who knew every detail of their lives, their organization and their crimes, was unshaken by all the wiles of their defenders. At last, after so many years, they were broken and scattered. The cloud was lifted forever from the valley. McGinty met his fate upon the scaffold, cringing and whining when the last hour came. Eight of his chief followers shared his fate. Fifty-odd had various degrees of imprisonment. The work of Birdie Edwards was complete. And yet, as he had guessed, the game was not over yet. There was another hand to be played, and yet another and another. Ted Baldwin, for one, had escaped the scaffold. So had the Willoughbys. So had several others of the fiercest spirits of the gang. For ten years they were out of the world. And then came a day when they were free once more. A day which Edwards, who knew his men, was very sure would be an end of his life of peace. They had sworn an oath on all that they thought holy to have his blood as a vengeance for their comrades and well they strove to keep their vow. From Chicago he was chased, after two attempts so near success that it was sure that the third would get him. From Chicago he went under a changed name to California, and it was there that the light went for a time out of his life when Etty Edwards died. Once again he was nearly killed, and once again, under the name of Douglas, he worked in a lonely canyon where, with an English partner named Barker, he amassed a fortune. At last there came a warning to him that the bloodhounds were on his track once more, and he cleared, only just in time, for England. And thence came the John Douglas, who for a second time married a worthy mate and lived for five years as a Sussex County gentleman, a life which ended with the strange happenings of which we have heard. End of chapter 7 Epilogue The police trial had passed in which the case of John Douglas was referred to a higher court. So had the quarter sessions at which he was acquitted as having acted in self-defence. "'Get him out of England at any cost,' wrote Holmes to the wife. "'There are forces here which may be more dangerous than those he has escaped.' There is no safety for your husband in England. Two months had gone by, and the case had to some extent passed from our minds. 
Then one morning there came an enigmatic note slipped into our letter-box. "'Dear me, Mr. Holmes, dear me,' said this singular epistle. There was neither superscription nor signature. I laughed at the quaint message, but Holmes showed unwonted seriousness. "'Devilry, Watson,' he remarked, and sat long with a clouded brow. Late last night Mrs. Hudson, our landlady, brought up a message that a gentleman wished to see Mr. Holmes, and that the matter was of the utmost importance. Close at the heels of his messenger came Cecil Barker, our friend of the moated manor-house. His face was drawn and haggard. "'I've had bad news, terrible news, Mr. Holmes,' said he. "'I feared as much,' said Holmes. "'You have not had a cable, have you?' "'I have had a note from someone who has. "'It's poor Douglas. "'They tell me his name is Edwards, "'but he will always be Jack Douglas of Benito Canyon to me. "'I told you that they started together for South Africa "'in the Palmyra three weeks ago.' "'Exactly. "'The ship reached Cape Town last night. "'I received this cable from Mrs. Douglas this morning. "'Jack has been lost overboard in gale off St. Helena.' No one knows how accident occurred. Ivy Douglas. Ha! <sighs> it came like that, did it? said Holmes thoughtfully. Well, I've no doubt it was well stage managed. You mean that you think there was no accident? None in the world. He was murdered? Surely. So I think also. These infernal scourers, this cursed vindictive nest of criminals, "'No, no, my good sir,' said Holmes. "'There is a master hand here. "'It is no case of sawed-off shotguns and clumsy six-shooters. "'You can tell an old master by the sweep of his brush. "'I can tell a Moriarty when I see one. "'This crime is from London, not from America.' "'But for what motive?' "'Because it is done by a man who cannot afford to fail.' one whose whole unique position depends upon the fact that all he does must succeed. A great brain and a huge organization have been turned to the extinction of one man. It is crushing the nut with the trip-hammer, an absurd extravagance of energy, but the nut is very effectually crushed all the same. How came this man to have anything to do with it? I can only say that the first word that ever came to us of the business was from one of his lieutenants. These Americans were well advised. Having an English job to do, they took into partnership as any foreign criminal could do, this great consultant in crime. From that moment their man was doomed. At first he would content himself by using his machinery in order to find their victim. Then he would indicate how the matter might be treated. Finally, when he read in the reports of the failure of this agent, he would step in himself with a master touch. You heard me warn this man at Burlston Manor House that the coming danger was greater than the past. Was I right? Barker beat his head with his clenched fist in his impotent anger. Do not tell me that we have to sit down under this. Do you say that no one can ever get level with this king devil? "'No, I don't say that,' said Holmes, and his eyes seemed to be looking far into the future. "'I don't say that he can't be beat. But you must give me time. You must give me time.' We all sat in silence for some minutes, while those fateful eyes still strained to pierce the veil. End of the Epilogue an End of the Last Valley by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Read by David Clark bgdavid.wordpress.com and www.bgcoffee.net Thank you for listening.